Welcome, welcome. And uh, the sedra we're working on for this coming week is the Etchanan. It's the second parsha of the book of Dvarim, of the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, again, it's a continuation of this speech that Moses is giving to the Jewish people and really with huge encouragement not to lose faith and uh, to be loyal to the Torah and loyal to God and not to worship idols. And uh, so we're going to continue with that and I'm going to start the to share the screen with you. Let's see what I've got here for you. <laughs> where we are okay all right so um baruch ata adonai eloheinu melech haolam asher kitshanu bemitzvotav v'tivanu lasok pedivrei torah amen amen so here he is moses saying v'nishmar tim ma'od v'nafshotechem guard carefully ma'od very much guard very much your souls because you did not see any picture, any anything uh, that showed something on the day that the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. So, of course, uh, in Deuteronomy, Mount Sinai is known as Mount Horeb. That is the terminology that we use for Mount Sinai at that, at that particular moment. But he's saying, you know, when you really experience the divine voice, right? When, when God spoke those first two commandments to you and you heard God, you had an experience of the divine, this powerful experience, you didn't see any picture of anything. Right, you did not see an image of anything, so this is a very serious warning that Moses is trying to put out that there is nothing physical in this world, right? Anything that can be depicted that um, is worthy of worship, of giving ultimate trust, and and that kind of thing to. And and to be very careful, and just that expression, nishmartem ma'od lebnav shotechem, that you should guard your souls very carefully, not to be lured into that. And of course, the other part of it, I think, uh, the idea that something can be captured with an image, uh, to think that the divine, the transcendent divine creator, can somehow be captured in in that kind of way. Uh, is also uh, another way of understanding uh, the that that God's greatness really spans the ineffable. Going on, warning, warning them, pin tashchitun, lest you act perversely, vasitem lachem pesel, and you make for yourselves a statue, tmunat kol samel. So again, this this would be a, uh, a, a an image, right? An image of anything. Uh, Lauren, forgive me, I overlooked looking the word up. Samel, do you have that handy for you there? It it says. Um, well, I have to read the whole sentence because I can't right. tell which word is which. But it says, "Lest you become corrupt and make for yourself a graven image, comma, the representation of any form, comma." Yeah, male or so female. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. So image, I guess, is what they're saying. Is uh graven uh graven image here. Okay. Well that looks like that may be is that not peso? Yeah, that's true. But uh, by the way, the Aramaic is helpful here because he, he says demut kol tsura, meaning the likeness of any shape. Right, so yeah. that beautiful translation of yeah, the, and here the, the representation word. of any form. Right there we go. Okay, so I'm going to type in that word there so that I have it for myself. Well, I think it's semel would be then form or shape because to munat would be the likeness or right. representation. Right. right. So thank you. Okay. 
and likeness. Let's do that here. We'll put that in here. So, whoops, sorry. There. Okay. Here it says rec rep representation. So either one. Yeah, well, likeness is represented. I mean, because like in modern Hebrew, it means a picture, right? It does. It does. That's the word. So yes, yes. So here we go. Tavnit. Here's the form. Tavnit, right? Zachar or nekeva, male or female. I thought that was interesting too, by the way. And here it puts likeness, but yeah. Yeah, I, I like the word tavnit as meaning a form, a shape, a shape of male well, or female. Yeah. Is it applying something built? Yes, something. They're constructing something. Structure. Yes, exactly. Exactly. In the shape of. So, mm -hmm. But also there's a, you know, I'm wondering to myself and trying to meditate a little bit on, you know, what the point is he's making here of male or female and what they understand by maleness or femaleness. Right. In other words, to try and look a little deeper, because we know that they had this. There's the whole notion of what maleness represents and what femaleness represents. Right. Um, in, 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 in understanding that neither are worthy of worship. So anyway, going on, Tavnit, the likeness, the form, call of any behema, uh, cattle, right? Asher Ba'aretz, which is in the land. Tavnit kol tzipor kanaf, the likeness or the shape of any winged bird. Asher ta'uf bashamayim, which flies in the skies. And I don't think they have Rashi here. We aren't going to have any Rashi until verse 19. Okay. Tavnit, again, the, the form, the shape, kol remis, of any creeping thing, ba'adama, on the earth, anything that creeps on earth. Tavnit kol daga, uh, the, the uh, likeness or the form of any fish, right, or sea creature, asher ba'amayim, which is in the water, mitachat la'aretz, below the earth. Uh, so again, uh, it's interesting that he is specifying in this particular way to create and perhaps underscore what he's talking about and being very specific. Kol daga, any fish, right? Uh, uh, we had that. Uvpen tisa enecha, lest you lift up your eyes, hashamayim, heavenwards, veraiti et hashemesh, and you Behold, you see the sun, the et hayarech, or the moon, the et hakochavim, or the stars, called tzva hashamayim, the whole host of heaven. And this this terminology of tzva hashamayim, it has to do, you know, we know it's the modern word for for army, but I think it means sort of an array, or some kind of organized pattern um, and nidachta you turn aside the hishtachavita lahem and you uh, worship them you bow down to them vaavadatam and you serve them you know, I, I always thought of it as more of a multitude you know referring to great numbers rather than a specific mm -hmm. order or pattern. Yeah, well, I I guess the reason why I'm thinking of it is that an army, you know, an army, it isn't just a large number of people. It has very much to do with how well they're organized together and work together. Otherwise, they just sort of fall apart. And yeah, but it's used in a lot of other contexts, I think, is just referring to great numbers. I'm not as sure. You'd have to give me the examples. Oh, I don't remember. I just know because I know the word that I, you know, I see it all the time and I note what it's. Yeah, mean, no, I think it's. You know, and then when I see it. I think, quite honestly, I think that uh, that um, Israelite culture was very much influenced by Babylonian culture. And we know that the Babylonians were astronomers because they were astrologers. 
that there was this there was this belief as there is today that somehow we are influenced by the course of the stars and the heavens and i believe that in that first prayer before the shema right um where it says ma'ariv aravim etc that actually where it talks about how god organizes and arranges the the stars is the way in which uh, judaism takes into consideration the the astrological ideas you know the the ideas of astrology but yet says nevertheless they are not just the physical elements of them that that in fact there is a div that the divine hand is behind all of this and i think that that's actually the way in which judaism deals with it in other words the idea that of determinism meaning that we are so uh, influenced by by nature by the host of heavens etc i mean i think this is the way in which people in the past try to connect their own lives into nature and make part make it part of it but to say that we don't believe that that is the ultimate that is the ultimate control of our lives that in fact god controls those very things that notion of again that notion of transcendency but the tzva hashamayim is more than simply the numbers of it uh, i think it has to do with its influence and its power and things like that so uh I, i'm pretty convinced at this point that that that's taken seriously i mean the fact that uh, i'm aware if i'm correct that indian culture uh, in india and in the far east they they still very much take in take very seriously uh astrology and and those sorts of things and and feel that it it has it has a lot to say in terms of human behavior but uh yeah i know we well, we get it yeah. also when we use the word host it generally means multitude you know in english i think it's the old word for army though i think it's an an antiquated word for army well it's it's actually um related to the to the words guest and host yes okay but it, but also i wonder if the word hostile and might for be yes that's related because foreigner yeah mm -hmm. but Should i don't know about I'm, I'm, yeah i mean i, I am really, looking it up yeah okay so so like stranger foreigner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. enemy yeah okay and it's just interesting that those would be related to guests uh, it <laughs> Stranger is and guests, like the well, same I mean, okay i think it has to do with encountering the fact that that it involves an encounter of some kind but i think of like the host descended upon whatever and it, it means the army descended you know this organized mass of human beings but i think it also has it's got to do with the fact that it 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 in it, it has to do with engagement and and encountering which can either be for good or for evil at any rate going on with the sins the nidachta right okay so we did that right asher uh, this is an interesting statement here asher uh, halak hashem elokecha otam so this word halak can mean to divide chalak means a part right uh and here we have zamin here in the aramaic which which has that idea that god apportioned it right that god apportioned the lord your god apportioned them these these particular you know the beliefs in these particular things to the other nations lahol hamim to all the nations tahad kol hashamayim underneath all the heavens and this leads us actually to what i consider to be a difficult rashi and uh, it's one of those situations where i think it's reflective of uh, a time sadly to some extent there's some of it going on even now uh where this where there is enmity and hatred and things like that uh and especially the way in which jews were treated in the past and to some extent it's reflected in present day antisemitism which is just this irrational hatred so going on so let's see here we go upentisa enecha and lest you cast your eyes up 
להסתכל בדבר, so it means to look, to observe this thing, ולתת לב, and to uh, concentrate, לתת לב means to, to pay attention, something like that, שים לב here nowadays, if in, the, in modern Hebrew means pay attention, לטעות אחריהם, to, to uh, go, um, to make, לטעות means to make a mistake essentially, right? To follow them uh, by mistake. So that, you know, that you believe these things and believe they have the power over you, etc., etc. Asher chalak, and here's the, here's what I consider to be a, a, a difficult Rashi, right? Sahi l'chol hamim, to all the nations. And on the simple level, it could mean, and even then, even if we translate it as, you know, which God apportioned to the other nations, it still raises all kinds of questions, right? Does it mean that the fact that other nations may practice idolatry is okay because God apportioned them? But then it raises the question as to why? What did they do to deserve uh, the fact that they have this false, these false beliefs? So it's problematic. So, so he says, he explains la'ir lahem. So la'ir lahem would mean, in a sense, uh, let me see if that's actually quoting from the Torah here. I don't think so. Um, but, but apparently it's saying, you know, that, that, that they would consider these to be legitimate. It says here it's from Megillot 9. Yeah, Megillah. Yeah, that's the track from... Megillah. Right. Megillah. So that's the interpretation in the Talmud on page. It, it says here eight, and apparently it's, you said it says nine over there. 9B. Okay. So it's a, a, a bad reference. But anyway, that's uh, it. That's the interpretation. How do they interpret Lahair Lahem? It just says to illuminate for them. Okay. And okay. then in parentheses, That's, all yeah. peoples. Yes. So again, interesting. I wonder if the Gemara is dealing with the difficulty uh, that when it says that God apportioned it to them, it just means to give them illumination, just like he does for all, you know, for, for the other things too, you know, for all people, for us as well. In other words, the idea, let me, I'll try and explain. Um, in other words, uh, all that God meant to do was to illuminate these, you know, to use them as sources of illumination, just like we use the sun as a source of illumination or the moon or the stars, okay? And that they themselves, that it was the nations themselves that uh, misrepresented them as gods, that it was the people themselves, in, and it's not suggesting that God did anything to try to, you know, deceive them. But here we go, okay, davar acher le'elohut, another interpretation that God gave it to them as gods, as idols, right, that they should see these things as gods. So here's Rashi explaining this. So lahair lahem, he means to to be their gods, to act as, to serve as their gods. Lo mina'an, that God did not prevent them, mi lita'ot acharehem, from making a mistake in following them. Ella, however, hechalikam, he, and again, the word chalak can also mean smooth. In other words, he smoothed the way, he made it easy for them. Bedivre havlehem, in their vain words, right? In their, in their, in uh, their, uh, gosh, mistaken words, let tardam min ha'olam, to remove them from the world. Wow. I mean, that I find to be a very difficult, difficult Rashi and a very difficult piece for me simply to accept. Right. However, he goes on to say, the Chainu America Rashi gives another uh, 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 supportive uh, example from Psalm 36. Ki hechelik elav ve'enav. In other words, that he made it easy in his eyes, limtso avono, in order to 
determined to find out his iniquity, least no to hate him. So in other words, ah, tough, tough, tough concepts here. Um, that I just, you know, how how one tries to to find a place for these particular things. Um you know, I mean, I think, for example, of Bilam, you know, of where Bilam wants to go and curse the Jewish people. And finally, God says, okay, it's all right for you to go. And then, of course, the angel is there to kill him. And that in a sense that if we are stubborn enough, at a certain point, God says, okay, you're going to be that stubborn. I'm not going to make it hard for you to get yourself really into trouble. But even that, you know, sort of sounds counter to our idea of a kind, you know, and loving God. And so, you know, trying to wrap my head around this particular, this kind of Rashi isn't easy. Uh, uh, and, you know, I come up with sort of trying to think of it contextually and knowing at least to some extent the hatred and the and uh, the terrible, terrible, terrible ways in which the Jewish people have been treated. So it's hard. It goes against my understanding that all humanity is created in the divine image. The question is whether we can mess things up sufficiently. And I also don't feel comfortable with blanket, uh, you know, blanket condemnations of other peoples and cultures. And this comes very close to sounding like that. And I think we have to try very hard you know, not to not to take it that way. Or we're being tested. You know, that's the other the other alternative that I have in dealing with this. So there's no question that uh, we ourselves have to be very careful uh, but between the words of Moses and the interpretation that we have here, not to be lured into various types of invidious idolatry, which I think actually go on to this day and are actually a serious issue so if you have any comments i certainly welcome them going on yeah i do um please okay uh we're not supposed to make graven images of anything that is in heaven or earth below you know whatever everything the ark with the winged angels yes over yeah. it right it's an exception but it's all what is the exception that proves the rule or is it you know right. is it oops or very nice so i think, yeah. thank you thanks golda for for bringing that up the point is not to worship them right it's saying to make these things and to worship them because that's what that, I figured is what we right, were dealing with here. That's the big issue because for some people, they become iconoclastic. And I don't think Judaism is preaching iconoclasm. Right. Okay. I don't know. Iconoclasm? I don't know. Yeah. Right. It's because, you know, for a long while there, you couldn't, you couldn't make anything that looked like anything. Right. Right. And we know there's no reason at all, but not because, because, you know, I've got Jewishy things all over my house that have. Right. Right. that have that look like people that look like right. things that look like yeah. whatever you know well not yeah. like god but because we don't know what god looks like but you know well not just not can't just put that. god in a box well not just that yeah. but again the idea that they might be worshipped so there's absolutely nothing to suggest that these cherubim that were on the on the ark were an object of worship now i know that in this they're moment, a focus though um they're symbolic yeah. well uh, like where we put the ark and we put everything at the east because that's where we're supposed to be well I mean, it's iconography, all kind of i think iconography is always symbolic i don't think that people yeah. worship icons if they have a little statuette or a, fo a picture you know like right. of the rebbe the the Lubavitcher rebbe or of jesus or whatever i don't think they're they're worshiping the photo i think it's symbolic it's always symbolic Right. Uh, I wouldn't say always, you know, just like never say never, don't careful about always, because when they talk about the statue of Mary bleeding and stuff like that, that they really actually are worshiping these things in a sense. 
that it's so in other words I see what you're saying yeah it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's subtle you know you have yeah, I to see what you're saying that right. there's a subtle distinction here it, it's a it's an easy leap yes it is yes it is mm -hmm. i agree with you and i think for that reason you know that in 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 uh, mosques you never see pictures they they develop this beautiful calligraphy as a as a way of of an art form because of their not wanting in any way to make pictures of of um, you know of things so well, there's, a, there's a much greater sensitivity on the part of islam regarding iconography I, I learned that in um the old um european synagogues of eastern europe that they generally and also their illustrated um bibles and Haggadot that they would use a lot of times animal pictures Yes, because they were distinguishing even though this one says don't even put do animals but right. what they were distinguishing is that god being people being created in god's image right so right. that was right. a little right. too interesting. close interesting huh yeah i mean it's it's an interesting issue and um you know the my understanding of idolatry is actually it has to do with replacing uh god that is to say the ultimate and transcendent one with anything else that that is essentially the nature of idolatry that it isn't even though here we're seeing it more in terms of icons you know and physical images but nevertheless the idea is this replacement of of the divine of the ultimate divine creator of the universe with something that is a physical object but I mean, I think we have to be careful because, you know, uh, do do when the way in which we relate to computers and and in fact, you know, artificial intelligence these days and this kind of stuff, you know, are we getting close to, you know, putting our trust in these sorts of things and recognizing that they are tools and nothing more than that? At any rate, uh, at this point, let me see where we are. Okay, so. I think we finished. Did we finish the rush? Yes, we did. At any rate, there is there is stuff to think about with this particular passage. As I said, it's not an easy, not an easy passage to work with. Not for me, anyway. I'm, some people might find it easy. I, I have to tell you, I, I so truly believe uh, in humanity and that and that God is the 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 God of humanity, and that other religions are simply other places in the palace especially nowadays so okay we'll stop i'm going to stop the share and thank you and uh please god we will continue tomorrow <laughs>